वंदा मी बनते रिक्वेस्टिंग फॉर क्षमा याचना एंड शील याचना उकास वंदा मी बनते भारत न कथम सर्वम अपराधम खम तुम्हे भनते द्वितीय ओकाश वंदा मी भनते गारत न कथम सर्वम अपराधम खम तुम्हे भनते तथ्य ओकाश वंदा मी भनते गारत न कथम सर्वम अपराधम खम तुम्हे भनते ओकाश वंदा मी भनते गारत न कथम सर्वम अपराधम खम तुम्हे भनते रिक्वेस्टिंग फॉर फाइव रिसेप्ट ओकाश हम भनते सद्धि पंच शील धम्म याचा मी अनुगहं कत्वा शील देत मे भनते द्वितीय ती ओकाश अहम भनते ती सर स पंच शील धम्म याचा मी अनुगहं कत्वा शील देत मे भनते तथ्य ती ओकाश अहम भनते ती सर स पंच शील धम्म याचा मी अनुगहं कत्वा शील देत मे भनते नमो तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्तस्त
ยังเตสีเลนาโภคสัมพทาสีเลนานิพพุติยันติทัสมาสีลังวิโสทะเยตามันเตสาธุสาธุสาธุ Thanks, Bhante, for coming after a long time. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, there are a few questions, Bhante. Can we start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, Bhante. Uh, uh, Bhante, when one understands Samadhi, it means uh, he uh, one can be Sotapanna. How it can be happen only the basis of Samadhi? Um, there are two levels of samadhi, and the mundane or lokiya level of samadhi is in many ways similar to to faith. Uh, it means the acceptance of certain principles, some, uh, certain underlying um, ideas about life, about um, uh, what is good, what is bad, what is best. And um, these provide the conceptual um, framework um, on which to follow the path of the Buddha. That level of samadhi is essential for liberation, but it is not enough in itself. The Lokutra level of samadhi is the clear uh, experiential understanding uh, penetration of the Four Noble Truths. So uh, our path of practice begins with samadhiti on the, uh, the worldly or the mundane level and culminates in samadhiti on the Lokia, uh, Lokutra level, um, which signals the um, attainment of one of the four levels of enlightenment. Uh, second question. Uh, Lord Buddha fulfilled paramis for eons. Which force made him fulfilling paramis i'm sorry i missed that which uh, what what made him to what what made him to fulfill his parami what made him to accumulate the parami or to uh, I, I ask again lord buddha fulfilled paramis for eons uh -huh. which force made him fulfilling parami I'm still, I can't understand. I'm sorry. Which force? Yeah, which force made him to fulfill the parami? To, sorry, what was the last word before parami? Force. Force. To, 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 sorry, to the very last part of the question, I, I still can't hear clearly. Uh, but the uh, question is, uh, Lord Buddha uh, fulfilled his parami for eons. Which force made him to fulfill his parami? Yeah, I can't. I can't understand the last <laughs> word before parami. Uh, okay. Which force led force, him? To... Yes, yes, Bante. Which force made uh, led him to fulfill his parami? I still um, let, let me just talk about parami. I, I'm sorry, my I'm getting old now. My ear not so my ears not so good. Um, well, the the Buddha um, to be the Bodhisattva means the Buddha to be, um, and his initial um, inspiration came from uh, as in the time of a previous Buddha. And uh, that was what um, set him off on the path of practice. In fact, if, if we look in the, in the Buddha's um, discourses, in the suttas themselves, 
he never refers to the 10 Baramis, which form the basis of the Theravada uh, commentarial tradition. And in fact, this is one of the uh, teachings which there is a uh, deviation or dis di distinction from the Mahayana uh, tradition in which they single out six Baramis. Um, so the, the, as I understand it, the, um, the commentators went, went through the Jataka stories and extracted from the Jataka stories this list of 10 virtues. But I don't believe myself that it's like a, like a curriculum for, for the Bodhisattva um, that, oh, now you're a Bodhisattva, you have to uh, fulfill these 10 uh, Bharamis um, in the way that it is sometimes presented. Nevertheless, why I think that they are all um, very important qualities, um, of course, um, to develop. And I think that it is worthy of note that the, the last parami uh, to be developed is the final um, step on that journey towards the last lifetime as Bodhisattva was one in which he fulfilled the Barami of Dana. And so the, the um, abandonment, um, I think, would probably be reasonable case of, of his children um, rather than being an indication that that Buddhism has um, a low opinion of family and family obligations um, is on the contrary um, a point that is considered of all the practices over many eons the final and most difficult um, thing for the, the Bodhisattva to accomplish uh, was uh, letting go of this uh, strong ties of love to to his children um, and of course in in the Jataka story then there was a like we can say a happy ending but it is indicative of the fact that not just uh, Buddhas but um, any any follower of the Buddha any Savaka um, can only realize this uncompletely unbounded um, and um, upamanya um, state of metta and, and love and kindness uh, when his heart is not tied to any particular human being uh, or family member. So that is to accomplish that great boundless metta, then the uh, the, the Savaka and uh, following in the footsteps of the Bodhisattva himself has to learn to um, abandon those ties of familial love. So I, I apologize if I've not answered the question, but I hope that I've made some uh, reasonable or interesting comment about the Barami. And um, I don't know, is, it, is there a way I can read these questions as well? I don't know how uh, to do uh, Okay, uh, Pandey, I'm posting this question in the chat box. I don't have to bring them up on my screen. I'm not very... Uh, no, I can't, I maybe see. carry on with the next question. Yeah. Okay, no, sir. Mala uttar mein ala. Okay. Okay. Uh, this question asked by Mr. Ravindra. He say he got the answer. Okay. Thank you, Pante. Okay. Uh, Pante, uh, please explain uh, any hilarization, any, any, I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand. View rises in the world because people don't understand origin of the world. 
and in eternalism view rises in the world because people don't understand cessation of the world regarding samadhi please explain um so the one way that the uh, or, or one way of looking at at uh, samadhi or the um as the the middle way the middle path um is is the path between eternalism um and um annihilationism and so i i always found it very profound and very very um very very interesting that the buddha should um point to the underlying reasons why eternalism and um annihilationism are so popular and what is the psychological reasons uh, why why those are so attractive views um and given that the the buddha's teaching is based upon the principle that liberation true peace true happiness comes through understanding then um he points out that the annihilationist uh, excuse me the eternalist view um is based upon a lack of observation of cessation so if we are in our practice in our meditation in our in our daily life if we are observing the five khandas observing the body and the mind then we are observing arising and passing away and the more we observe passing away of every single phenomena of which we are conscious in our lives then the idea of an eternal state which does not pass away uh becomes um to seem unlikely unbelievable impossible even and similarly with annihilationism that is based upon the lack of observation of the arising of phenomena so i excuse me i i i really explained them back to front so if we say arising comes first um through lack of observation how things arise through causes and conditions um lack of awareness of that can uh condition a belief that death physical death is the end of everything and with the repeated observation of arising annihilationism it seems less and less unlike seems less and less likely and convincing and uh impossible seeing passing away similarly undermines and eventually uh re- uh destroys the belief in uh eternalism so these two ideas um that after you die you go to eternal heaven or eternal hell or the idea that after you die there's nothing the buddha is not arguing with these as philosophical positions but i think a quite revolutionary approach he's he's uh, he's saying that they um these ideas uh derive their power from lack of observation of the body and mind and that they lose their power and eventually disappear through um profound understanding and penetration of the three characteristics uh but they, if if someone practicing dhamma and somehow he broke shila then he or she tend to get consequences in short duration with compared to non practicing dhamma person yeah that's an interesting point i i i i i've 
I think I agree, actually. It's somehow, I, I don't have, have any um, scriptural backing for this, but from my, my own observation, it seems that Dhamma practice seems to speed up the results of kama. Um, I'm not, I, I think it's clearer with, with bad kama and um, breaking precepts. But I, I, I wouldn't be confident enough to, to lay this down as a kind of a rule of, 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 of Dhamma. Um, but just from my own experience over years um, with many monks and nuns and observation, I would say I'm, I'm broadly in agreement with that. Yes, I, don't, I can't explain why. I remember when I first started to practice and so i was in in bodh gaya in 1976 and that was when i first met people doing the tibetan purification practices there were a number of westerners there um, doing the hundred thousand prostrations and speaking with i, I still i still remember this speaking with uh, one or two of them they would say that almost everyone got sick doing them and that their teacher had explained that this is what uh what happens through these purification practices that you uh you speed up the um the the, the comic result of impurities in the past so that that was an idea um, belief if you like from tibetan tradition but uh, as i say i'm i'm broadly in agreement with it. Bhante, uh, do you encourage meditator to involve in academic activities, which, which are uh, highly critical and activate the mind? What is your suggestion? Um, well, it would depend on the um, On, on the person really and their role and if they are i mean if obviously if their their livelihood is dependent um upon using their their brain and uh, i i recommend people to um d develop an interest and curiosity and and, and wish to um be good at what they do and if so if they're academics to be good academics and that means to um to be reading a lot and and um and so that's not a very uh peaceful activity sometimes that's part of the comma of uh academic livelihood um as regards um dhamma practitioners generally then i would point you to the the threefold uh, structure of pariyati, patibhati, and patiweta. And here I would um, explain pariyati to mean that study of the teachings which provides the firm foundation for patibhati and then eventually patiweta or liberation. So I think that without any um, study at all, then one can easily uh, get lost, get caught up in one own, one's own views and opinions, and that's uh, that's dangerous. So there needs to be a um, certain amount of time spent on studying the the Buddhist teachings, and this does not have to um, undermine or be in any way uh, harmful to, to meditation practice if reading is taken on as a, as a Dhamma practice and one reads um, with, um, with discipline, not just as a, um, an escape from, from meditation, read a book instead and get inspired quickly, but um, to supplement one's understanding and to make sure that you have 
right view. There are so many different approaches and views out there these days um, that it's good to have some, some good theoretical basis for one's own understanding. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of study for its own sake um, or as an intellectual uh, pastime, uh, which study can easily become. And I, I, th I think I'm, I may say that sometimes I feel Abhidhamma scholars get caught up in that. Um, it's, it's just so profound and so um, absorbing that um, it's easy to forget that all studies should be within the context of the Eightfold Path or in, an, in the idiom I used just a few minutes ago, in, in moments ago, of pariyati bati, bati 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 veta. So you should always have the end in mind. You know, why study this? What's the purpose? So I, I think study provides information and it provides encouragement or uh, inspira um, inspiration. So those are the things you, know, you want. You want knowledge, um, basis of right view, and something which is in, encouraging, inspiring, uplifting um, at, cert at certain times. But if I think it's also um, clear that some people can read uh, books and their minds become focused and gives rise to joy and pity in the Dhamma and contributes um, very effectively towards their overall practice. Whereas other people um, read and their mind become full of agitation or full of doubts and they're, they're just not able to benefit in the same way from study. So this, this requires you to take a, a, a really close look at yourself and see um, whether, to what extent you can use study of suttas and study of, of the teachings in our tradition as a way of supplementing and supporting practice. But if it detracts from practice, makes uh, uh, and, and, and takes away your interest and your commitment to meditation and you find yours studying instead of meditating, then that would not be the middle way. So it's, it's a question of, of looking and being very honest about your own character and your own ability to, um, to harmonize study and practice. Why, why it is difficult to keep distracting thoughts, uh, distracting thoughts entering consciousness while meditating, and how I can, how can, how I can remove it? Well, with with thoughts, um, distracting thoughts, ag agitated thoughts, um, we have to start off by looking at our way of life and um, the kind of activities that we, um, that we partake in that affect our minds, make our minds more prone to agitation. So observing um, speech that, um, agitates the mind and leaves a trace, the kind of speech where after you've stopped thinking, it's going round and round in your mind and, and um, causing mental disturbance. Um, and from that observation, then you're led to uh, sense restraint and to applying mindfulness uh, to the precepts. And so the actions that you take the speech, um, the activities, uh, I think particularly these days with social media, and we have uh, opportunities to, 
distract ourselves um, 24 hours of the day uh, without almost any effort and and the things that distract us that appear on our screens you know they they are designed to distract they're designed to um enchant us and and absorb our interest um so if you're following the you know, the path of, of peace and to find um that inner stability and clarity of mind then you need to apply your intelligence to uh, creating for yourself an environment a way of life um, a way of living your life uh, which cuts down as much as possible on things that agitate your mind so it's not just a matter of finding like a really um, effective very powerful meditation technique um, to deal with agitated thoughts um, because you're not dealing with the root cause of them um, which um, as I say is, is, is a lot to do with, with the way that you generally live your life and if you're not being mindful and you're allowing the mind to wander here and wander there throughout the day it's unrealistic it's not fair to expect your mind just to change in midstream and 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 just suddenly let go of thoughts and and not have that agitation so the agitation of mind that you experience in meditation is the result of kama that you're you're creating during the day but also i think it can be a like a wake-up call in the same way that having an ache or a pain in your body it's not very pleasant but there is a silver lining and it's telling you that there's something that needs um needs looking at and needs dealing with so if you have consistently experiencing a lot of agitation in meditation then i i would say it's important to look at the um your daily life looking at ways of cutting down on entertainments and and um all the um the distractions that um surround um, us all these days as regards the the meditation itself then um always we have to be be beware of vipava tanha which means the desire not to have so if you want to have a mind which is completely calm and nothing in your mind at all then um, agitation is very frustrating and getting frustrated with with agitation and getting discouraged by it and averse to it these all um, increase the problem and so to the, the very beginning um, just to uh, let go of all those negative reaction to um to agitate your thought so having a a a, a basic um meditation object like the the breath then we just have to be very patient and confident that this will work out if we stick with it and bringing the mind back to the object again and again and developing a, a, a sense of appreciation enjoyment of the meditation object um, to the extent that you prefer to be with the the breath or your meditation object than to be thinking of this and thinking of that so creating a very positive relationship between the mind and the and the meditation object is an important skillful means now in the case where there's just uh like a, a storm of thinking of this and that coming into the mind the the technique that uh, i would recommend is not to um fight with that that thinking 
And if bringing the mind back to the object again and again is not working, then to use the technique of simply being mindful of the thinking. So it's just like sitting on, it's like a wild horse running around. And instead of trying to uh, lasso it and tying it to a post, then jump onto the back of the horse and just be very mindful of where it goes. And uh, you can try this, but I, I find myself, I've found and taught people to do this, it's actually surprisingly effective that um, people who never done it will say, well, you know, so you just allow your mind just to go here and go there like a crazy thing and you're just along for the ride. But no, it's not like that because once you're on the back of the horse uh, or you're there with a, this non-judgmental awareness, um, the mind just slows down and stops by itself. Um, if So thinking and agitation you know, two, two elements, two aspects to it. One is like imagery in the mind and one is uh, like words in the mind. Um, and so in the case that it is essentially uh, words in the mind, then uh, one uh, technique, this is a supplementary technique, is just to um, grab onto the, to the last word you know, as you become aware of uh, of of a word of a sentence, then take the last word or the last couple of words, and then consciously repeat them again and again and again and again, until the mind becomes bored with it, and it just puts it down without any effort required. It's just boring. And then if it happens again, there's another thought. So let's say another thought comes into the mind, 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 and then it'll let go. And then it'll let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. So whatever thought comes into the mind, the moment you're aware of it, this is something you can do, is just consciously repeat the, the last word or couple of words in the sentence. In the case of imagery, then you can use, uh, uh, I, I, so I come from a generation where, where we had televisions when I was a kid and you turn off the television and it would just sort of go like this and then there'd be a little sort of little light in the middle of the screen and then the light would disappear. And so, so for those of you of an older generation, you can remember that or can visualize it then you can just imagine this, uh, this image in your mind uh, dissolving into, uh, into this little light and then disappearing. Or you can use a skillful means similar to grasping onto the last word of a sentence um, by simply allowing the colors to merge into each other or to gradually fade away, uh, or just to be there with it um, and allow it to, uh, to pass away by itself. So these are some related ideas and, and skillful means for dealing with agitation. But I would like to, to repeat that um, the, the skillful means by themselves um, will not be effective um, if you are not putting effort into reducing distractions and disturbing um, conduct and speech uh, in your daily life. Pante, uh, can you explain a bit more about the difference between mindfulness and awareness and consciousness? Uh, I don't know. Um, these, there's so much um, variation in the way that these words are used and different teachers use them in different ways. And so I, I'm not sure that I can say 
this is what this word means, this is what this word means, this is what this word means, and you should just follow that. Um, it's more a matter of listening to teachers and seeing how they um, they use those words themselves. So it's it's helpful when when words have um, clear parallels in in Pali. It's more difficult when there are there are words from English language, for instance, which are a lot more vague and don't correspond exactly to to Pali words, and that's where a lot of the confusion comes. But even with uh, sati or mindfulness, um, these days, then, uh, with the popularity of secular mindfulness, then um, so many books and so many different groups and teachers of mindfulness that the the meaning of mindfulness, the meaning of sati hasn't changed, but the meaning of mindfulness now covers quite a wide spectrum of uh, mental states, and it's not simply the the sati um, that we find in the in the suttas. So, if someone asks me well, what does mindfulness mean, then um, I I'm not sure that I have the sort of complete answer. Um, I can say what sati means. Um, which is, you know, how sati, uh, how mindful, the word that mindfulness originally uh, seeks to translate. So I, th I think we can say that, that mind mindfulness is, is essentially bringing something to mind, holding it in the mind. And in the case of um, say knowledge um, from the past then it has some some similarity to to memory in the sense that you are mindful of obligations you're mindful of instructions from your teacher you're mindful of of the the way to to um to repair a car or something you know you have you have um studied and you're able to bring the knowledge that you need to the present moment in order to deal with a particular task or problem. Um, in the case of in meditation practice itself, then your task is to bear the object in mind and not allow it to slip away. So the failure of mindfulness is like allowing the object to slip out of the mind so you're no longer holding that object in the um uh, i said in awareness of holding that holding that object in the present moment so um so i think that we can distinguish between mindfulness of uh, um, of something that we are recalling from the past and mindfulness of a present object but the, the the function is is similar so then we have the accompanying term sampajanya or clear comprehension and whereas sati is included within the samadhi group of the threefold training sampajanya is included in the wisdom training so it's the wisdom aspect and um what complicates this question is that quite often the Buddha spoke about mindfulness without referring to sampajanya, which is usually translated as clear comprehension or full awareness sometimes. Um, but it's clear that he is not speaking of a mindfulness which is without Sampajanya. I hope you can understand that. So my my understanding of this is is that it was just um, shorthand term. So instead of saying sati sampajanya, 
the Buddhist said sati on many occasions, meaning sati containing sampajanya or sati with sampajanya or sampajanya in brackets, if you like. Um, so sometimes he distinguished between the two and sometimes he didn't when he didn't, it was assuming that sati uh, in that case uh, includes sampajanya. So this is why it's study is a little bit difficult sometimes and we're um, speculating somewhat on um, words that were spoken 2,000 more years ago and the commentaries are always not always that helpful um, but some pajanya the wisdom faculty um, let's say uh, you lose your mindfulness uh, and you're thinking about this and thinking about that and then you realize oh I've lost I've lost the thread, I've lost my breath. Um, what I'm thinking about now is not what I intended to be um, thinking about. That's Sampajanya. So there's this kind of wisdom that, oh, you've lost, you've lost the way. This is not what you should be doing. Wisdom aware of the purpose of what you're doing um, and to what extent what you are doing is in harmony with the realization of your goal. So these two things go together. So awareness I, uh, is kind of like, like a um, rather ambiguous term. And it do, I think in that case, I'm not going to define it because it depends exactly what, what you want to use it for. Consciousness is a translation of vijnana. So we have the consciousness arising at the at the eye ear nose tongue body mind so it's that simple quality of of knowing in knowing in its most basic kind of sense so knowing that there is something um impinging on the eye knowing that something is impinging on the ear but the kind of knowing that um oh that's Ajahn Jayasaro on the screen, or that's um, an insect flying across the screen. Though that's a different kind of knowing, that's the sanya knowing. So vijnana is the kind of knowing or consciousness, which is a sort of the absolute basic um, awareness of the presence of an object. <clears throat> Uh, Pante, how to understand three phases and 12 aspects of Four Noble Truths? Sorry, I missed that. How to understand? How to understand repeat? How to understand three phases and 12 aspects of Four Noble Truths? What was the first one? The... Three phases. Three phases. Oh, okay. Three phases and 12 aspects. Yeah, okay. So if we take the, the Four Noble Truths, uh, dukkha, uh, samudaya, niroda, and maga, or suffering, causes suffering, cessation, and the path to cessation. Um, on the the Buddhas uh, identified his um, his enlightenment with his full penetration of the four noble truths, and. And explains that in the Dhammajaka Bhattana Sutta, his first discourse, explains that the, the insights, the knowledge that came to him on the night of his enlightenment uh, could be divided into, into three phases. So you have three phases of four noble truths, three multiplied by four is 12. So with each one, um, the first is... Uh, there is suffering. So it's the, the recognition of the existence of dukkha, of suffering. So that was the first um, knowledge, insight that arose in his mind. And the second uh, was that the, the correct response to that knowledge or the correct practice or the duty that one has towards suffering or dukkha and that he understood to be full comprehension and the third phase 
was that um, he realized that he had fully fulfilled that second phase. He had fully comprehended Dukkha. So for the first noble truth, the first insight, there is Dukkha. Second, Dukkha is something that should be fully comprehended. And thirdly, I have fully comprehended. In the second, um, there is Samutaya, there is a cause of Dukkha. It's not just the will of God or it's not just random, but there is cause of Dukkha, um, Dunha, craving based on ignorance. And that was the first of the insights. The second is that craving or samutaya should be abandoned. And the third level was, I have abandoned craving. So in a similar pattern, the third noble truth of cessation, realizing there is cessation of dukkha, and secondly, that that cessation of dukkha should be realized. And thirdly, I have realized that cessation. The fourth, he realized that there is a path to that cessation, the eightfold path, and that that path, second insight, that path should be followed. Um, and thirdly, or developed, I think is the word. And, and lastly, I have developed that path. So four noble truths, just the, 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 the insight into the existence of the four noble truths. The second round um, of insights is the correct way to practice or to, 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 deal, with, to deal with them, to re relate to them. And the last round, the recognition that the Buddha has completed his, um, his practice regarding the Four Noble Truths. So Four Noble Truths with three, um, three rounds of insight um, makes 12 altogether, 12 phases, or I can't remember the word. Uh, Pante can uh, uh, Pante can uh, uh, focus, uh, uh, focus on uh, five hindrances in short. Can teach about five hindrances in short. How to reduce it? Okay, so the there are many different ways of of talking about defilement, and many different groups of defilement, um, and these groups. Um, differ in that they um, appear in different contexts or in different ways of looking at, at practice and different ways of looking at the mind. Um, and one of the most um, common of these groups and the one the Buddha gave great importance to um, is the five hindrances. And we can say samadhi really begins where the five hindrances end, or that the five hindrances are the defilements of mind which are exposed by meditation practice. They are hindrances both to the peace of mind and quality of mind, and also to wisdom. So there can be no real progress in Dhamma unless we uh, can learn how to abandon these defilements. The first of these defilements um, uh, is the attachment to the desire for um, the things that we like, basically. Um, so the, the word kama in K, um, long A, M, A, karma, um, sensuality, um, is, is sometimes uh, taken to refer too much to the really coarser um, aspects of, of, of sensuality, particularly sexual feelings. 
but in fact it's much wider than um, than that and I, I prefer to talk about karma as, as anything that you like to think about anything that when you get stressed out when you get upset about anything when you're bored when you're depressed you like to think about that thing and it makes you feel good so it might be about some pleasant experience in the past or might be um uh might be about food or it might be music or it might be um some uh entertainment of, of some kind or another but it might be uh or or, or sport or or it, it might be something to do with the world and politics and anything basically that you find interesting that you like to think about um and when the mind becomes bored with the meditation object or is unable to sustain um, its focus on the meditation object um, it will often um, tend to um, look for some kind of small enjoyment and entertainment um, with a memory or imagination of some kind so this goes as i say the whole spectrum from the coarsest kinds of sexual fantasies all the way to quite noble um, matters but the 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 underlying uh, mental state is of one of interest in the, the pleasure of thinking about something the the second um is um sort of the mirror opposite uh, where the mind um, indulges in thinking about people things that we don't like it can be um, recalling people's actions and speech to have hurt us that we don't like or it could be um, aversion to the people around us the situation the, the mind can can latch onto almost anything um, and feel angry about it if it wants and irritated and why is it like this uh, shouldn't be like this and uh, uh, and, uh, and and the thing is there's a kind of a, for, for, for some people there's a kind of in, perverse enjoyment in in being really negative about something getting caught up and thinking all the bad things about somebody or something um and it's a way of escaping from the present moment and distracting oneself from the meditation object so so it's not necessarily the really um really vicious and and uh, we are part of the you know the the pali word um can suggest quite strong negative emotion but it's any any kind of negativity and um indulging in in it and it can be quite quite mild and uh, on quite innocuous subjects the the third hindrance is the um covers areas of uh stiffness of mind and, and laziness of body sloth and torpor so somebody just see your whole body is you you can't be bothered and you feel you just want to lay down um, um or, or the mind is very kind of stiff and and uh, won't won't go to the meditation object and um, one of the, there's a there's a simile uh, given by one of the great tibetan teachers of trying to to spread um butter um uh, out of the uh, will be out of the fridge would it be yeah, like out of a tibetan cave maybe um on onto onto bread uh, so you have something that's like really really hard and, and trying to um trying to spread it on something that's the idea of that kind of uh, stiffness of mind and um and 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 that um, stiffness of mind can be quite subtle and uh, many meditators um, get caught in that state where you're kind of quiet there's not a lot of agitation in the mind but it, it's it's not 
samadhi it's just this very refined stiffness um, um, of, of mind which is hindrance so again this you, you go from this very uh, coarse kind of nodding and falling asleep um, during meditation um, to kind of resistance and boredom and and uh, uh, dull stiff states of mind are going up to quite refined dullness which can easily be mistaken for a state of meditation the fourth hindrance is uh, agitation um, which i've spoken about at some length earlier in this session and uh, it also includes like guilty thoughts just going over and over things you did and, and shouldn't have done or, or shouldn't have done and did and, and um, if only this had happened if only that happened I'm such a bad person and um, this this kind of indulgence in self-recrimination over actions speech in the past um, this is uh, kind of uh, one one aspect of this uh, this hindrance so it's different from from hiriotapa and recognizing one's behaved poorly and um, revealing this and uh, not hiding it and making a determination not to behave not to speak in such a way again in the future this is different from the hindrance where we're just going over and over and, and it's very much based on self and i'm such a bad person and i shouldn't have done this and i should have been better than that so that's a very toxic way of thinking and it's a hindrance and the last of the hindrances is uh, skeptical doubt now it's important to recognize that that uh, not all doubt is is uh, criticized by by the buddha or considered to be a hindrance indeed the buddha praised um lay people lay buddhists sometimes or lay uh, villagers not necessarily buddhists that, um oh you're doubting about things that um should be doubted about you know it, sometimes doubt is a sign of wisdom and and humble heart that you recognize you don't have all the information that you need to make a good decision good judgment and so you recognize yeah I'm, I'm not really sure about this i don't really um not don't really have all the information i need so that kind of doubt is is not a hindrance um quite the contrary but the skeptical doubt that um is an obstacle in meditation um is when you just um where you've reached the point where you have to make a choice and apply effort and you still want some kind of guarantees before you put any effort into something that it will really work out and um and there are no such guarantees and uh, constantly reevaluating and, and, and worrying about the the practice and the teachings um every every um twist and turn of the path for every difficulty that it comes out oh maybe i've got this wrong maybe this isn't right and maybe i should try something else and so that's the most debilitating of the hindrances with the others you know you, you've got anger in your mind or you've got sensuality in your mind you say oh yeah i've got a problem i've got to deal with this but with the fifth hindrance you don't even maybe you don't even think you've got a problem or do i have a problem maybe i don't maybe this is uh, so uh, you can just go around in circles with that one so those are those are the five hindrances and um and the buddha encouraged us to to study them and learn from them and so they're teachers in some ways because they're showing how the unenlightened mind works and uh, what uh, what triggers these hindrances um what feeds them what reduces their their power what eliminates them this is uh really important work that we can do to um, understand these hindrances 
the, the Buddha says that, um, well, well, there are a number of similes to the hindrances and um, some of these you'll be familiar with, the one with imagining the mind is like a bowl of water and the, the first simile is like you put all, all these different colors in the water um, with all different colors, the, the transparency of the, of the water is, disappears and you cannot see through the water to whatever's below it. So that's a simile for the first. The second is if you've got um, boiling the water, so it's agitated and, and uh, the, again, we can't see through the water, so there's no wisdom there. And there's no peace to the water because the water's bubbling up with with anger. With the third hindrance, this is as if there's some um, mossy and green algae or overgrowth covering over the pond, uh, covering over the water. So you can't see the water itself, and certainly can't see through the water. Uh, fourth is like there are the agitation. It's like there are waves in the water um, and the fifth is like the water is concealed in darkness and you can't see um, the way ahead so <clears throat> um, you can't see the water at all excuse me so I won't go into all the similes for the five hindrances but um, again there there is uh, important that the way that you're living your life keeping precepts uh, <clears throat> being mindful being restraining the senses, living with contentment, um, kindness, and, and generosity to those around you, living your 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 life in a dhammic way and one which is in harmony with the principles of dhamma. Um, this is um, reducing the the. Uh, the food or the ground for for the hindrances when you practice you should be very patient um, developing uh, chanda and enthusiasm for the practice faith that the practice really works um, learning from experience and just applying oneself with patience and consistency and good humor um, don't get on your own case. Don't be too critical uh, when you get caught up and um, distracted by hindrances and defilements. It's okay. It's like teaching a child. And it's, no, it's, it's the way kids are. Um, made a mistake. Um, stop. Start again. It's a very, very, uh, it's consistency, patience. Um, maintaining or, or creating this real interest and commitment to practice and these these defilements these hindrances will will gradually fade away but then is it okay to take a few questions yes yes we can go to um what 7 30. Uh, but they, how can one encourage oneself to meditate and to enjoy meditation? Well, uh, first of all, meditation has to be seen not as a kind of a special activity and, and something separate from the rest of your life. And uh, it, it, it has to be integrated into your whole way of living your life, as I've mentioned on a number of occasions. Um, I would say that that um, it's important to 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 keep coming back to the the four noble truths um, and to reflect that dukkha arises dependent on defilement. Dukkha ceases with the cessation of defilement. So. Um, and, and the cessation of defilement comes about through practice of the Eightfold Path or development of Sila Samadhi Banya. Now, if that's the case, um, then as long as there's defilement in our minds, we'll never 
no liberation from dukkha. Unless we develop the Eightfold Path, we'll never know true happiness. So the, if we accept that observation, that teaching, then it means we have very important tasks to see to in our life. One is how can we prevent as yet unarisen defilement from arising in our mind? Secondly, how do we deal with the defilements that are already arisen? How can we um, introduce into the mind uh, the virtues that have not yet appeared in the mind? And how can we take care of those virtues that have arisen and, and develop them until they reach maturity? Now, I would say that the practice of Buddhist meditation is the only uh, activity ever devised and ever ever um, encouraged in the history of human human race, which answers the four most important those four important challenges at the same time. So when you're meditating, uh, putting your mind on your breath, for instance, you are your first challenge is how can I sustain attention on my breath in such a way that hindrances won't arise and then if hindrances do arise how do i get rid of them um, how do i introduce into the mind mindfulness clear comprehension patience contentment etc and in the cases where they have already arisen and how can i um, develop them to their highest level so when you're meditating, this is exactly what you're doing, isn't it? Um, you're, you're applying mindfulness and patience and contentment and so on and developing them. So in the beginning of meditation, uh, you're working a lot more with those first two with hindrances. And then as the meditation develops, you're moving more into the realm of the Bojangas or the seven enlightenment factors. So I find this a, a very good reflection to say, well, why meditate? Well, well, you know, why do anything? <laughs> Basically, I mean, why, why, why live your life? What's the purpose of your life? If, if your if your goal is liberation, um, then meditation is the uh, only or the most effective way of leading yourself onwards to that liberation which you aspire to without meditation then uh, it'll never happen so keep coming back to the 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 reasons the ultimate reasons and you know not just caught up in the daily um, meditation session but but reminding oneself of the big picture and the overall um overall path that you're seeking to follow in life um the best uh, the most motivating uh, factor in any activity whether it's worldly or spiritual is progress um, and the reason why people become unmotivated in meditation practice i think is because they uh, they set their sights too high um, and overlook uh, the minor um, uh, the minor advances and the minor victories that one achieves during the day and then just um, in terms of becoming a little bit more um, patient, a little bit more aware, a little bit kinder, uh, a little bit more patient and so on. It's, so looking at uh, coming, bring your sight down and looking just at the general improvements in your ability to keep precepts and generosity and kindness and patience and integrity and these things, um, uh, rather than looking at you know, samadhi and, and uh, enlightenment, uh, that those things will, will come about in their own time. But in the meantime, as a skillful means of 
um, motivating yourself to keep up the practice, um, then um, come down a bit and just look at increases in the quality of your life and relationships with the people around you. Um, having a group of friends is very helpful. Uh, you will have ups and downs and sometimes when uh, maybe your health is not so good or you're very busy you've got, or some kind of crisis in your working life or your daily life, then having good friends and um, being able to share with them and to encourage each other is also um, contributes a lot to keep going in meditation um, and don't be too result oriented in the short term um, because that's a sure way to to disappointment for most for most people uh, you might be one of the lucky ones but uh, there's a lot of barami but basically there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and it's going to be snakes and ladders rather than a stairway to heaven and so you have to be very very patient and consistent in your efforts Uh, Bante, how can one overcome fear? Overcome? Fear. Fear? Yes. Fear, okay. Well, fear is the, the, the default um, for an unenlightened being, basically, because um, the attachment and the view of psychiatry, a view of um, body and mind as being self, creates um, the, the opposite, what's not self. And so you have this dilemma of uh, looking after yourself and protecting it from everything else that's not yourself. And sense of vulnerability and, and fear of what might happen to self. So at one level or another, uh, there is going to be a certain amount of fear, and certainly fear of death um, is repressed and tends to be manifest in, in other areas of life. A lot of time when people talk about fear, I, I actually, I think, talking about anxiety um fear of um fear of losing face fear of separation from what's the from the love fear of having to suffer in the future and th these are actually more like anxious thoughts about the future um fear itself is um I, I would I would restrict to things like you know, sort of fear of ghosts, fear of uh, an immediate uh, imminent danger. You know, so the heart's racing and the adrenaline's flowing, and uh, I think the other kinds of fear are more more to do with worry and anxiety and thinking. So I'm going to an just answer about fear for, for the time being, and in my definition. And I would say that um, with strong emotions like, like fear, there is a, both a mental and a physical component or dimension. And that it's uh, most effective to bring the attention to the physical sensations in the body from the head to the foot um, to do a, a kind of a, a scan somewhat on the, in the style of, of um, Mr. Goenka or to adapt as you feel and fit, but adopting this interested, curious um, uh, scan of you know, what's going on. What is fear? Where does fear manifest in the body? Is there a, is there fear in the head, fear in the face, fear in the shoulders, fear in the chest, fear in the belly, fear in the back. I mean, where is it? What's it feel like? What is this fear? So rather than being afraid of fear and, and, and reacting to the fear, and um, then 
grounding awareness, grounding the mind in the um, in the experience um, of the body in the present moment. And that will in itself uh, stop the mind from running wildly after, uh, oh, what was that? Is this, uh, is it this, is it that? So I'm thinking in the case of, of sort of ghosts and things like that. Um, if you, if you uh, try to be too rational about your fears and sort of argue with yourself, maybe um, you can stop the, the crazy thinking and uh, emotion for a while. But if the adrenaline's already been, been flowing and the body is in an altered state, through the fear, then a physical sensations will tend to uh, trigger a whole new wave of fearful thoughts um, shortly after you um, brought the mind back to a certain sense of calm. So, so grounding awareness in, in the physical reality that we call fear um, is I would say the most effective way of dealing with it. With the anxious thoughts about the future and about what happens if, what if that happens, what if this happens, and then that's that's a stinking problem. Um, and one in which we need to have the kind of sharpness of mind which uh, recognizes as the mind begins on this kind of train of thought um, and can let it go right at the very beginning and not allowing it to follow along that path. Because the, the, the longer you um, leave it, then uh, the more difficult it becomes. And, and things that only have a very slight chance of occurring. And when you, the more you think about things, then the more real it becomes, you know, the, even the most outlandish uh, kind of uh, possibility starts to seem like it really could happen simply because you think about it a lot. So anxiety is, is a matter of much sharp mindfulness and letting go of uh, this toxic thinking right at, the, right at the beginning before they gather too much momentum. Whereas fear, um, I'm uh, advocating grounding awareness in the physical reality. Is it okay to take one more question? Yes, okay. Uh, Sante, uh, first of all, greetings, and I am so much grateful for you taking your time out to interact with us. Ajahn Chah's Remembrance Day was just a day before yesterday. So yeah. can you share some anecdotes? Um, yeah. Uh, this sort of thing, everybody's heard all these anecdotes before. I, 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 I would say... Um, The one that I that had meaning for me for me personally when I was first um, at um, well let me say when I first arrived at Wapapong, um this was in December of 1978 and I was wearing white I'd spent a few months with Ajahn Sumedho in the monastery in England and come out to, to Thailand in, in November and traveled around a little bit and um, eventually arrived at Wat Bapong in on the full moon day of December in 78. And the, the monks had just completed their Patimoka recitation and Ajahn Chah was sitting under his kuti um, speaking with his disciples and I was met at the gate by an Australian monk who looked after me and took me to to see Ajahn Chah and 
And when when he when I saw him, then I immediately had this um, very emotional reaction. I said, "Oh, this this is what it means to be an arahant. This is what an arahant is." Of course, I had no um, no way of telling who's an arahant, who's not an arahant. Um, and no, no special knowledge of any kind, but the, the faith arose um, very strongly in my mind. And, and, and then uh, after, um, after the monk, he uh, introduced me and told me that I come from England, that I'd been a student of Ajahn Sumato. Uh, Lumpo Shahi was drinking from a um, from a cup of, of herbal honey, um, honey flavored herbal tea. Uh, and he called me over to him and I crawled in front of all the, all the people there over and he gave me this, uh, his, his cup of tea to drink. So I must, maybe I looked kind of pretty worn out or, or something, but you know that was uh you know it, it, compare it with with uh worldly it's like i fell in love with him at that moment you know and it was so it was the faith and this sort of sense of personal connection and and um and i think that that kind of faith is what stood me in good stead throughout the um, the next months and years when you know there are some very difficult times and it's uh, not easy being a monk in a forest monastery in in those days um, hard hard life and physically hard life as well but it was not so much my my knowledge of the teachings and i had studied quite a lot before i arrived at the monastery but just this absolute confidence that there is such a thing as nibbana there are people in this day and age who are realizing nibbana the path is open um, and all it remains is to is to follow the path um, which has been illuminated by monks like my teacher so looking back on those early days it wasn't that there was such a great number of very profound teachings and of course for the first year or so i couldn't understand thai very well also but it was his example and in a with a teacher like that you there's no question about trying to be mindful. You just feel you have to be mindful. You cannot be unmindful in his presence. And, and you feel it's like a, a mirror. Every small fault in yourself becomes painfully obvious. Um, and so it's, you just feel uplifted um, being around someone like that and just seeing uh, how important and how necessary it is to uh, to follow this this path of practice okay thank you uh ravindra sir yes sir uh, thank you i think maybe uh, enough for tonight and we may uh, have yes. yes but the blessings uh, but they, we want the blessings from you. Okay, I give you the Yatavari vaha pura paripurenti sagarang hewami vaito tinang petanang upakapati 
ิจิตังบัติตังตุมหังกิปะเมวะสมิจจตุสัพเพปุเรนตุสังกปะจันโตปันนรสุยธามณิโจทิรสุยธาสัพพิติโยวิวัจฉันโตสัพพโรโควินัสโตมาตังมวัตวันตรายโยสุขีทิฆายุโคภวะอภิวาทนาสีเลสนิจังวทาปัจจายโนจตารุธรรมวัฒนติยายุวโนสุขังพลัง So I wish you all very good health and to be uh, firmly established in dana and sila and pavana. May your defilements uh, wither away every day and become less and less. And the virtues and goodness in your heart grow and flower and and come to fruition. Uh, may you all be well. Thank you, b u d d h e